helpful too. Great, thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right, awesome. All right, well, while everybody is still joining in, I will start with some quick intros. My name is Sam. I work with Fairy God Boss. And if you didn't already know what Fairy God Boss is, we are the largest career community for women. Our platform supports women in their careers through free resources like company reviews, job listings, webinars with various experts such as Melody, virtual recruiting events, and a community where users can be honest about their triumphs and failures either as themselves or anonymously. So for today's webinar, before we get started, we will have a Q&A at the end. If you look to the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q&A feature. Feel free to leave questions throughout the webinar and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. You can also use the chat feature if you like, I'll be watching in there. And the webinar will also be recorded and sent out as a follow-up so you can feel free to rewatch uh, anything you may have missed. Um, so with me today is Melody Wilding. Melody is a peak performance coach and licensed social worker. She helps high achievers master the mental and emotional aspects of striving for a successful career and a balanced life. Her clients are managers and leaders at places like Google, Facebook, HP, and Deloitte. She helps them gain more confidence, assertiveness, and influence. This allows them to reach goals like being promoted twice in one year and doubling their salary. Melody also teaches human behavior at Hunter College in New York City. Thank you so much for being with us today, Melody, and mm -hmm. over to you. Yes, thank you so, so much for having me. Um, I am going to have my eyes on the chat and I'm going to be asking you guys to participate as I'm going through the webinar today. So please do, you know, to start, I would love to know where you're watching from today. I am in balmy, unbearably hot New York City. Um, and so how, hopefully everybody else is staying cool today. Um, so we have Charlotte, Boston. I think we're going to have people from all over the country, which is really incredible. And I think that's one of the awesome parts about Fairy God Bosses community. San Antonio, Pittsburgh, Oregon, Minnesota, all over the country, which is just amazing. So thank you so much for spending a part of your workday with me today. I'm very grateful for it. And let's dive in. So today we are going to be talking about finding freedom from imposter syndrome. And as Sam mentioned, I'm Melody Wilding. I'm your instructor for today. And before we get started, I do want to give Fairy God Boss a huge thank you for inviting me today. I have been writing and contributing to Fairy God Boss for several years now. Uh, and it is really a true honor to be part of everything they're doing to elevate women in the workplace. Now, you are here today because you want to learn how to overcome imposter syndrome. So chances are, I'm going to bed, that you can relate to one of these three statements. So I want you to let me know in the chat which of these you relate to the most. So number one, I give the impression that I'm smarter than I really am. So you may feel like you've tricked people into thinking that you're intelligent or more competent than you actually are. Or number two, you worry that one day soon, your manager is just going to come by your desk and say, pack up your stuff. We figured out you're faking this whole thing. So you might live with that fear that one day you'll be exposed for the fraud you actually are. Or number three, perhaps you relate to this last statement that you hesitate to ask for help because you think that doing so will, will reveal that you actually don't know anything. So in many cases, this can look like not speaking up in meetings because you don't think you have anything smart to say or not asking questions because you don't want to reveal that you're incompetent. So in the chat, I want to hear which of these relate, you relate to the most. So I'm seeing a lot of number two and three, a lot of one and three, number two being exposed. Yeah. Terrified that clients will figure out we don't know what, our, what we're doing. So I wanna tell you that you're in the right place and to more importantly reassure you that as you can tell, you are obviously not alone. And the truth is that 70% of people will experience imposter syndrome at some point in their career. The unfortunate part of this is that most of us don't, fare, don't share these experiences of insecurity and self-doubt. So it can lead us to feeling very isolated. I hear from my clients oftentimes that they feel like they're crazy 
for thinking these things. They're the only ones. Um, or that they feel broken or weak for struggling with these types of thoughts. So today what we're going to do is give you some tools to change that and develop more steadfast belief and confidence in yourself. So that's why today we're going to cover number one, why you may be more prone to imposter syndrome versus some of your peers. Number two, how imposter syndrome keeps you stuck and keeps you from reaching your full potential. And number three, most importantly, we're going to go over a whole collection of actionable ways you can break through that self-doubt, including a simple framework that you can use anytime you feel like you're starting to spiral down into those fraudy feelings. So what all of this means for you is that by the end of our time here today, you're going to be able to pull yourself out of those self-doubt spirals when they threaten to derail your day. I think we've all had those moments where those thoughts just take hold and distract us or demoralize us for the rest of the day. You're going to feel more confident recognizing, more importantly, owning, believing in your accomplishments. And number three, you're going to be able to seize opportunities you're definitely qualified for um, and ones that you deserve instead of shying away from them. So before we go any further, uh, I do want to introduce myself. I'm Melody Wilding. I'm an executive and high performance coach, uh, and I'm also a licensed social worker. So my specialty is helping smart women, just like you, get out of their own way so that they can stop doubting themselves and actually reach what they're capable of and reach their full potential in their careers. Uh, Sam mentioned, I also teach human behavior at Hunter College in New York City, and I write for places like Fairy God Boss, Forbes, and Business Insider. So over the past eight years, I've worked with hundreds of top performers at some of the world's biggest companies. So names you know, like Google, Facebook, HP. And my clients are of all different levels, managers, directors, senior leaders, even CEOs of publicly traded companies. But regardless of their title or their industry, they all have one very important thing in common. And that is, they are what I call sensitive strivers. So sensitive strivers are high achievers who think and feel everything more deeply. They are highly attuned to their own thoughts and emotions, as well as the thoughts and emotions of other people. So sensitive strivers tend to be lifelong career-oriented goal-getters. So lots of them are former A-plus gold star type students who bring that same drive with them into the workplace. So some signs you may be a sensitive striver are that you're deliberate. You always think before you act. And this means that you tend to excel at strategy and planning, um, but it can also mean that it's hard for you to move past second guessing yourself and overthinking everything. Uh, sensitive strivers also tend to be very conscientious and they try to prepare for every eventuality that could happen. Um, but what ends up happening is that if they over prepare, so if they're caught off guard in meetings um, or unprepared, they might get easily overstimulated. And Sensitive strivers, because they're so attuned to everything that's happening around them, often sense conflict easier than other people, which makes them true masters at empathy and connecting with other people. But on the flip side, constantly being vigilant of everything that's happening around you can be really mentally and emotionally draining. Um, so simply put, sensitive strivers are deeply caring. They give their 100% to everything they do, especially their work, all with an inner world that's on overdrive. And many sensitive strivers rise really quickly in their careers, but they also tend to face a silent struggle, a daily battle with self-doubt and stress. Because when those two qualities, when sensitivity and ambition meet, can be a really tricky combination. And many of my clients come to me because they feel like they're buckling under the weight of those insecurities. Um, so being sensitive really means that you have a more finely attuned nervous system than other people, 
and that your brain is specially designed to process information more deeply. So if the average person has 100 pieces of information coming in their brain at any one moment, um, you on the other hand would feel like you have 1,000 or 10,000 points of data running through your brain and you spend time analyzing and chewing over each one of those more deeply. So it, that comes out of cost, right? And just like a computer, if the memory is not maintained, it starts to slow down and crash. And sensitive strivers are the same, which is why it's really important to look at how you're managing your emotions, your thoughts, and your energy. Um, so sensitive strivers also tend to be a little bit of a type A perfectionist type, meaning they hold themselves to unrealistically high standards. They place a lot of um, uh, pressure on themselves to succeed. And sometimes that comes at the cost of their own well-being. So I want to check in and see if any of this is sounding familiar. So how many of you would consider yourself a sensitive striver? <laughs> so I see V says, oh my God, I've been a sensitive striver my whole life. This is me. Yes, this is me. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad to hear this is resonating with you. Um, if so, you're going to get a lot of value out of today's training. Um, but even if you don't fully identify with the sensitive striver label, today is still going to give you a lot of different tools that you can use to help overcome imposter syndrome at work, since all of them are based in neuroscience and psychology uh, in terms of how we make our thinking more productive and actually make it work for us, right, instead of against us. So let's get into imposter syndrome. So imposter syndrome is defined as a crippling self-belief that you don't deserve or you couldn't replicate your success. So you don't believe you're worthy of the success that you get, that you didn't deserve it or really earn it. And you're not confident in your ability to handle stress or challenges in the future. So you feel like a one hit wonder, right? Like, I, oh, I managed to do it that time, but I don't reliably think I could do it again. So in other words, imposter syndrome is about making inaccurate assessments about your own capabilities. And in, imposter syndrome tends to manifest in feelings that you're a fake, you're a fraud, that you'll be exposed uh, as being incapable or ill-equipped for your job. And the important point is that this is despite obvious evidence of your achievements, right? So many of you here may have uh, degrees, multiple degrees and certifications. You may get positive performance reviews, yet there is still this inability to internalize our own capabilities and our own success. So a few common hallmarks of imposter syndrome are downplaying your accomplishments. So you tend to say things like, oh, it was nothing, it was a team effort, um, or you brush something off as something that was unimportant or not a big feat that anyone could have done. Uh, many people with imposter syndrome also attribute their success to luck, thinking that they were in the right place at the right time or that they had special connections that helped them uh, land an opportunity. And most of the time, Imposter syndrome comes with a lot of second guessing yourself. Um, you may tend to be really indecisive or worry that you've made the wrong decision again because you're not, you don't trust in your own judgment and your capabilities. And uh, as many of you were talking about in the chat, people with imposter syndrome also fear being exposed. Like they'll come to be revealed, someone will figure their jig up <laughs> um, and uh, figure out that they, um, that they've fooled everyone into thinking they could accomplish something. So when we look a little closer, imposter syndrome actually breaks down into a pretty predictable cycle. And it all starts with a triggering event. So what we have in that upper left-hand corner. And this is some sort of a uh, challenge or some sort of an event we perceive as stressful. So let's say, you know, for the purposes of our example, it's getting assigned to a new project. That sets off this chain reaction of habitual thoughts and feelings. And these are those 
good old friends we have, self-doubt, feeling scared that you're going to fail, worrying constantly, all the anxiety, the stress, the fear. And those thoughts and emotions influence our behavior and typically falls into two predictable patterns. Um, so on the one side, we have people who uh, react to imposter syndrome with over-preparing and diligence camp. So these are the people who will overwork themselves to a point of exhaustion and burnout. Um, they're the one who will sweep in last minute to rescue and save a project just to make sure it gets finished. Or the person who classic perfectionism goes over the presentation a hundred times or reads the email 10 times before sending it. Um, and because you over prepare, you often do actually do well. So you actually do perform well, which reinforces your need to maintain that perfect record. So it feels like, oh my gosh, even more is at stake now. Um, so you also end up feeling that no amount of success is good enough. You could have all, you could have always done better. And then on the other side, we have procrastination. Um, so these are the people who have trouble starting projects or finishing them, uh, usually not for want or lack of skill, but because they worry that doing so will prove them to be unqualified. They worry that if they go through the project, um, they'll risk rejection, embarrassment, failure. So it's easier just to stay small and avoid any new potential challenges or reach assignments. Um, these are also people who I see stay in jobs way longer than is actually a good fit for them because um, they're scared to move on to something else because they, it will trigger that fear of, well, this really proves I don't know anything. So they'll just stick it out in the worst circumstance. Um, so which of these do you feel like you relate to the most? Um, and so as I was mentioning, what happens after you fall into those two typical behaviors is that you get this feeling of relief, you do accomplish something, um, but then you ignore and push that feedback away because you feel like you didn't deserve it. You feel like a fake or a fraud, the cycle goes around again and again and again. So what we're going to do today is really tackle um, our thoughts and beliefs and gain some tools around working with those. So people are saying, I'm just scrolling. Uh, Christina asks, do I see people bouncing between the two? Absolutely. This is not just you fall into one or the other. It's a mixture a lot of times. Um, sometimes we have more dominant styles for sure, uh, but I offer this too for multiple reasons, to help you get to know what your personal blueprint looks like because with self-awareness comes the ability to change our behavior, but also to reassure you that because this cycle is so predictable, that means we can gain mastery over it, right? So I, I do offer this as a way to help uh, reassure you that this is something you, you can overcome because it is so predictable. Um, so bounce between the two, staying too long in a position, most definitely, yeah, procrastinating. <laughs> uh, I procrastinate and then get good results and wonder if I made it easier on myself had I prepared better. Yeah. So whether you fall more into the diligence or the procrastination style, the results are usually the same, right? I think as a lot of you are mentioning here that there can turn into this reluctance to ask for help. Many of you mentioned that. Turning down new opportunities that you deserve and that you're qualified for. Uh, one I see a lot is avoiding feedback and criticism that could actually help you, right? It may be hard to hear, but it could make you better, could make your job easier lots of times and save you a lot of hassle. And of course, low self-confidence and low self-esteem. So the advice you've probably heard so far for dealing with imposter syndrome is to just be positive, right? Like tell your inner critic to be quiet. Just tell it to go away. You're awesome. You got this. But if you've tried this approach, you have probably found that it doesn't work that well. Um, it, it can kind of be like putting a Band-Aid on a much deeper issue. Uh, and a lot of times it actually ends up backfiring. You try to be positive, 
uh, but you can't because you don't fully believe what you're trying to tell yourself that you're amazing and you're awesome and you can conquer anything. So you end up feeling worse, right? Can anybody relate to that? Yeah. And a lot of people are saying like, I know I shouldn't feel this way, but it's hard to convince myself that I am capable, right? Yeah. So what I want to share with you next is a different way of relating to imposter syndrome. One that allows you to not resist your thinking, but one that allows you to channel it, to channel those mental superpowers you have as a sensitive striver, to manage your thinking more productively, right? It's not about making it go away, but about working with it more productively. Because when you stop trying to battle imposter syndrome and when you drop the inner struggle that comes along with it, that's when you can access and leverage that self-awareness you do have and use it to your advantage. So let's dive into that. Okay, so I call this process untwisting your thinking and it has two pretty simple phases to it. So number one, is naming it and number two is reframing it and before i work walk you through each one of these phases i just want to give you a quick lesson about how our thoughts work so earlier when i talked about that imposter syndrome cycle i mentioned that imposter syndrome is fairly predictable right there's this fairly predictable cycle that happens we experience that stressful event um, we have some habitual thoughts and it sets off this domino effect of um, certain thoughts and behaviors that ultimately aren't helpful and don't serve us. So it's easiest to think of our thoughts kind of like a broken record player. Um, so for those of you who remember, bro <laughs> remember record players, um, when a record player gets stuck on the same track, it gets stuck on a groove, right? And it just gets stuck on that same track and plays it over and over. And our minds are a little like, the same. Um, so we have these habitual thoughts that get very, these, the grooves for those thoughts get very rooted in our brain. We get very comfortable there. And so um, we get caught on that groove of you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You'll be exposed as a fraud, right? And so what we have to consciously do is be able to recognize that we're getting caught in that groove and pick the needle up and put it on a different track. That takes practice, that takes time to build the deeper groove, but when you do that, that's how you build healthier thoughts. So these negative thought patterns are called cognitive distortions in psychology speak. I'm not gonna quiz you on that, don't worry, um, but these are the automatic self-critical thought patterns that drive imposter syndrome. And just like it's helpful to know that this thing, imposter syndrome, has a name, takes some of the sting out of it and helps you know that you're not alone, it's essential to know that these unhelpful thought patterns are not a reflection of you or your identity, right? They're not evidence that you are a failure. They are simply habits that we built up over time. And if we take the time to understand them, to recognize them, label them, it helps us tame that unhelpful thinking that is developed over time. And so just like any habit, we can unlearn them and change them for the better. So the first step in untwisting your thinking, as I mentioned before, is naming it. And that is labeling the type of unhelpful thought or cognitive distortion you're experiencing. And there's many different types of co cognitive distortions. Um, I want to go through these so you can see which sound like you or what you're able to relate to. You don't need to write these down. I do have a workbook that I'm going to give you access to that will list all of these and walk you through the exercise I'm going to take you through as well. So let's just go through these quickly. So we have catastrophizing. So this is when you expect disaster. Um, so when you fall into those thoughts of, if this doesn't work out, I'm gonna end up broke and you know, like a cat lady on the street right? It's you go to absolute worst case catastrophe scenario. Then we have all or nothing thinking. So these are when we get into uh, thinking in dichotomies, thinking in extremes. Things are black and white. They're good or bad. There's no middle ground in between. So it's I have to be perfect or I failed. 
Then there's overgeneralization. So if something bad happens once, we overgeneralize that it will happen again. So we say things like, I'm always screwing up or things always happen this way. Um, so we extend one bad event to a lot of other bad events. Then we have mental filter, which is we dwell on a single negative event. Um, so if you're anything like me, you were that kid who in school, if you didn't get an A plus on a test, if you got a B, it was the end of the world. And uh, now that might look like obsessing over that one area of meets expectations, not exceeds expectations in your performance review, but you really hang on to that. Then we have emotional reasoning, which is you believe just because you feel something that it must be true. So I feel stupid, therefore I am stupid. I must be stupid. Uh, mind reading. So this is when we read into other people's emotions and we think we know what they're thinking or feeling. Um, so someone doesn't respond to your email, well, she must hate you. And personalization. Uh, this is when you hold yourself, you are overly responsible for things that are out of your control. So if a project failed, you take that on as meaning you as an individual didn't spend enough time on it and not really recognizing that there be, might be other factors involved. So like I mentioned, these unhelpful thoughts that feed imposter syndrome are largely automatic. And once you recognize them, you can control them. So here's exactly how to do this. Now for the next few days, I want you to write down examples of the negative self-talk that comes up for you. Um, and you're going to write down specific phrases that really occupy your inner monologue and the things that you're saying to yourself. And a lot of us have greatest hits. What my clients tend to find and what I think you will find is that a lot of what we say to ourselves sounds the same. Um, there, it may be applied in different circumstances, but even once you bring your awareness to the stories that you're telling yourself, you'll see a lot of repetition. Um, so for the next few days, I want you to record your thoughts. And when doing that, the next step is that you're going to label each one with the type of uh, cognitive distortion that it maps to. So in other words, you're going to name it. And then the last step is reframing the thought. And that is all about thinking about um, any facts or truths, evidence that logically demonstrates why the unhelpful thought is not true. So, uh, or telling yourself a more supportive story, looking at the situation with a different perspective that actually allows you to move forward. So what's most helpful here is assuming the role of a wiser you. This could be a you in the future when you're, you know, 80 years old and you're looking back at yourself now, what would you tell yourself? Um, so for example, if you are accusing yourself of always procrastinating, then I want you to actively generate examples of times where you have worked hard or put in extra effort or spent a lot of time preparing for a project. Um, so the goal here in this last step is to take your mind off of that one deep record groove and generate other perspectives, generate multiple ways of seeing the situation and some realistic evidence um, so you can move towards your goals. Okay, so let's see what this looks like in practice. So I'm going to walk you through this. And like I said, the workbook will have um, the, a table for you to do this on your own. Um, so you can see here, if the unhelpful thought is, I can't ever do anything right right? All or nothing thinking. Reframing it. What's a more supportive story to tell yourself? This is a minor mistake. You're stressed. Slow down, right? I wish I could tell myself that <laughs> many times. Um, unhelpful thought. If I speak up, everyone's going to laugh at me. Everyone's going to think I'm stupid. Catastrophizing, right? Thinking about the worst case scenario. Reframing it. Possibly more supportive. It's better to ask, just ask the question than for me to spend two weeks worrying about it and possibly going off in the wrong direction, right? The last one, my direct report didn't do a task right. It's just easier to do it myself, overgeneralization, right? I see this happen a lot with managers and leaders. 
Um, and with that, maybe it's time to approach delegation differently. So this takes practice. I'm not going to lie to you. This is not going to be an overnight solution. Um, because when you're caught in those moments of imposter syndrome, sometimes it's hard to access that more supportive thinking, that role of the wiser you. So I do want to give you a toolkit of other questions, self-coaching questions you can ask yourself in those moments. Um, these are questions that are very useful to have in your back pocket, even if you have them in an Evernote or a Word doc throughout your day, even just so you can revisit them in the moment. They're useful to help you tap into that inner wisdom that you know you have and to find what will work best for you. So a few of these. How realistic is this thought on a scale of one to 10? One being not at all, 10 being totally realistic. Where do you fall in between? How do I move to a different number, right? Maybe I'm at a three. How do I move to a six or a seven? How would my best friend, my personal hero, how would someone confident respond to this situation? So actually step into an alter ego, borrow somebody else's mindset until you can build yours. What would help me relax? Um, when we're in a stress state, our brain is literally acting from a fear area, from a very primitive fear area. So if you breathe, if you're able to slow down and relax, you're able to bring your frontal cortex, which is responsible for self-control, com uh, concentration, focus, you're able to bring that area back online. One of my favorites is, when have I handled something like this before? Um, so like I said, all of us have a tremendous bank we can actually pull from. Um, so going back and thinking about historical examples can really help. And another one I love to use is, let's pretend you do know the answer. Let's pretend you do know what to do next. What would you do then? Very simple, but can be very powerful in those moments. Okay, so the name it and reframe it strategy, like I said, is something you can use in the long term, but I wanna give you some ideas that you can put into practice today. So uh, when we don't internalize our success, it's very easy for us to push positive feedback away. So I want you to look out for instances where you fall into minimizing language. So things like, oh, it was nothing. I just threw that together, right? So the goal here is to really stop screwing yourself over, right? Give yourself credit and instead welcome in that praise instead of pushing it away. Most often we push it away because we're uncomfortable with it, but that doesn't help us get any better at accepting it. So when somebody does give you praise, I want you to shoot for a tweet length response is what I like to say. Um, because a lot of times we end up over explaining and word vomiting like, oh, it was a team effort and I didn't really do anything and this thing went bad and we just go on and on and on. Um, so when you get a compliment, I want you to practice saying thank you or thanks and then moving on, leave it at that. There was no elaborate explanation needed about uh, how you just barely made the deadline or how it was just luck, right? You don't need to prove or justify yourself to anyone. So if someone congratulates you on a major client project, um, just say thanks, I'm glad the hard work paid off, or um, thanks so much, that means a lot coming from you, right? It's, it can be very simple. And another way to really rewire that um, negativity bias that we naturally have where we pay attention more to our failures than our successes is to start keeping a brag file. So this is something, again, uh, an Evernote, a Word doc, uh, a file in your, in your email client, for example, even a small notebook where you keep stock of your accomplishments, where you keep stock of achievements, of projects that you worked on, of positive feedback that you've, that you've gotten. This is really handy, not only for your own purposes, if you're having a down day, it's something you can go back to, but it's also great come performance review time for updating your resume, your LinkedIn, um, because what I tend to find is that in those moments when we're put on the spot, we think like, oh my gosh, I have nothing to share here. I've accomplished absolutely nothing in the past year. 
But if we actually take the time to write it down as it's happening, you have that whole bank to go back to. And so Shannon says she calls it a yay for me file, which I love, I love that. And a kudos file, says Debbie, awesome. And so related to that, it's important to get skilled at taking in the good. And that's another way you can start rewiring your brain to focus on more of the positive. Uh, I like to have my clients do an end of the day reflection ritual where they focus on uh, three things that went well that day. So what did they enjoy the most? How did they use their strengths? What did they find the most satisfaction in? What was a moment where they made themselves proud, right? And this is going to help you focus on what went well versus always instead like imposter so syndrome driven, always focusing on where you're not measuring up, what didn't go well, uh, or where you're failing. And it's also a good way to put uh, some natural closure on the end of the day so that work doesn't follow you home. Because um, with imposter syndrome, we get those leaky boundaries, right? Where it's never off of our mind and we take a lot of that home with us. And if you're someone who tends to get self-critical or fears getting feedback, then you need to get better at practicing it more. That is the only way to build confidence in a skill set around something. So go on the offense, seek out rather than waiting for that feedback to come to you and it feeling like this monumental uh, thing when it happens, go out and seek it first. Um, so be proactive about it. And there's actually some research that shows that when we go act actively, proactively solicit feedback that we actually find it more helpful. Um, so this is about looking for opportunities to show your work earlier, more often with your team or with your peers to make sure you have that weekly standing meeting with your boss, that you're reviewing projects, expectations, wins, um, to blog about something, um, share it on LinkedIn. Um, so the goal with this is to get feedback more often, more frequently in lower stakes settings so that um, when you do get it at performance review time or what, whenever it may be, it doesn't feel like such a crushing, stressful experience. And imposter syndrome tends to thrive in environments where we don't really have a support or a lot of role models um, who can be around us and show us how they have been successful or even to help just normalize the experience for us that almost everyone goes through this. So seeking support, finding sponsorship, joining communities and being involved in those like fairy god boss, um, that, is where, uh, that is where those come in and are so important. So let's just go over what we've talked about today. So we have talked about what it means to be a sensitive striver and why it makes you more prone to imposter syndrome. We've talked about how imposter syndrome can hold you back from success, the name and frame it technique, and some other actionable ways to deal with self-doubt. So I wanna know, um, what will you do next? Because learning information is great, but it's only helpful if you actually put it into action. So I wanna get some accountability going uh, because we know that if you declare your action steps to other people, you're about 90% more likely to follow through. Um, so out of everything we talked about today, what is one step you plan to take? So end of day reflection, starting an accomplishment list, Got some people have a big interview today. Good luck. Recording your thoughts. Great. Yeah. And so I do have a free community that I want to invite you all to join. I would love to have you there. It's for sensitive strivers, just like you and me. Um, and it's called the Haven. And I'll put the link for that in the chat in a moment. Um, and like I said, you can also get the workbook, the strategy I gave you today. Um, I will share it with Sam so we can make sure that you get access to that. Um, and last but not least, if you 
want to talk with me further, you can find me at my website, melodywilding.com. Uh, and I think, Sam, if you want to hop back on, we can take some questions depending on how much time yeah. we have. Yeah. Yeah, we have some time for questions. So just a reminder, well, first of all, thank you, Melody. That was a really, really great presentation. Um, seems like everybody really enjoyed it. And we already have a lot of questions, but if you have another one, you can go to the Q&A on the bottom of your bar and we will get to as many as possible. So the first question, and this came from a bunch of different users, um, it's this idea that feeling that others are constantly judging them. How does this play into imposter syndrome and how should people get past that? Mm. Yeah, and that's a, that's a real common one too. Um, I think this plays into recognizing the story we're telling ourselves. So when we're, uh, we may be caught in mind reading when that's happening, worrying that other people are judging our capabilities. Um, so I would look at what story am I telling myself around this situation and what are other possibilities? Um, so that's a short answer to a very gigantic topic. Yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's a popular question, apparently. Um, another question we have from Dana is, is imposter syndrome ongoing or can you overcome it completely? <sighs> There's a bit of a paradox with imposter syndrome that the higher you rise, the more acute it tends to become. Because earlier in your career, there are there's a defined path. Right? But as you rise further in your career, that's left to less defined, things are more ambiguous, there tends to be more risk. Um, so we actually do send, tend to see imposter syndrome at higher levels of leadership. Um, but that doesn't mean, it's not something you can totally overcome. I think it's just something that's a part of being human. But like I said, we can make it more intense and we can have a different relationship with it so that it doesn't disable us. Um, so I think it's something, it's kind of like a friend if, uh, riding in the, the car seat with us. Um, so we can just learn to relate to those thoughts differently. Great. Um, another question from two different users is, how do you deal with imposter syndrome while job hunting? I do apply even if not 100% qualified, but mm -hmm. when approaching a network connection for a referral, the imposter syndrome kicks up big time. Like, why should this person help me? And I'm not even qualified. So how do you deal with that? Mm, yeah, well, I think it's great that you're already applying to things that you're not fully qualified for. I always tell my clients, if you meet 60 to 70% of the qualifications, go for it because you're probably underestimating your abilities. Um, with reaching out to network connections, I would think about what value are you providing to them? Um, so if you can think about... Um, particularly in job interviews. Uh, I always tell clients, if you can think of ways that you can help the organization or you have ideas for how they could improve something, um, you have a book recommendation or an article that you can share with them, um, it helps you feel like you're giving some value rather than just reaching out to that person for something. That's a really great answer. That's good advice too. Um, another question we have is, what happens if people seem reluctant to provide useful feedback? How should you go about working with those people? Yeah, there is a great book on this. It's called Radical Candor. If anybody has not read that, it's a fabulous book on this idea of getting and giving useful feedback. But I think letting that person know, um, first and foremost, I recommend having a conversation with your boss, with your colleagues about your preferences and style around how often and how you would like to receive feedback. Um, and understand your boss's and your colleague's style as well. Um, so it, can, it might be time to reset those expectations. And if you haven't already, let your boss, let people know that you do want more specific feedback. Uh, what would be helpful? Give them some guidelines around, when you notice I do X, Y, Z, it would be helpful if you pull me aside or send me an email. So try to be as specific as possible to help people help you. Um, and if you're not getting that type of feedback, uh, you know, re ask for what is one thing you could see me improve? What could I do better here? Um, so make sure you're act actually asking those questions. Like if you had to pick one thing, what's one thing you would have me work on, improve, or change? 
Um, and if it's really, really a chronic problem, um, you know, I, I do work with some clients who are just, they're in a culture where they're not getting that type of feedback, then it may be at some point it will come time to consider if this is, if it's actually a place where you can grow and get what you need. That's, that's really great. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions here. We have a lot still coming in. Um, this person asks, what is an effective way to talk themselves out of procrastinating because of that feel, fear of failure? Yeah. Uh, my best recommendation is that usually what tends to happen is that we're making the project this big. So you have to think about breaking it down into the teeniest, tiniest, babyest micro step to the point where it may even feel silly, like open the word doc and write the date. And um, because so many times we set such high expectations for ourselves that I have to do this whole deck by the end of today, do one slide or do five slides. Um, so break it down into really, really manageable goals because you need to build up what tends to happen with imposter syndrome and with self-doubt in general is that we make these huge commitments and these huge goals and then we don't follow through or reach them so we lose trust in ourselves and that just reinforces it that just makes you doubt yourself more so you have to build up momentum and uh, accountability with yourself so if you break things down into super simple goals even if it's, um, you know, I have a lot, a lot of clients who have success with Pomodoros, which is setting a timer for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then just working for that period of time. Um, but you need to build up that chain of successes. Um, and kind of related to that now, so this is on the other end of the spectrum. This person talks about how she doesn't want to reframe some things because she fears she might become too overconfident mm -hmm. and then might actually start not meeting expectations and appearing arrogant and inviting criticism. What should she do about that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hear you. Um, what's funny about imposter syndrome is that uh, there's the opposite of it, which is something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And the Dunning-Kruger effect is when someone doesn't think they have any faults. Um, they have overconfidence. And uh, so those people don't even ever think about imposter syndrome. So the, the funny thing about imposter syndrome is that if you have it, then you're definitely not an imposter. And you're definitely not overconfident. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the irony of it. But I think um, in terms of uh, over-indexing on it, I think this is where you want to recruit some of the people around you to say, you know, I'm working on X, Y, Z. I'm working on speaking up more in meetings or contributing more, whatever it may be. Um, what would you be open to if you see me getting overzealous or if you see me overstepping my boundaries? would you mind giving me candid feedback? This is something I'm working on and I'm still kind of feeling out how that works. Um, but I also think trust your gut. Uh, you, all of us have a certain comfort zone around that. So what confidence and what charisma looks like looks different to each of us. So I think thinking about what that ideal state looks for you, looks like for you and thinking about people you admire, like who are your heroes? Um, and sometimes a really helpful exercise I'll, spoil it for you all, but is to write down people you admire. So three heroes on one side of a piece of paper. What behaviors have you seen them do? What, what are actions that you see them take? Values that you see them live? Um, and why have those inspired to you? Why, why have those been important to you? And then cross their names out and write your own. Because usually those are qualities that are underdeveloped in us. Um, so that can be a good way to kind of get a temperature feel on where you want to go and not over index. Yeah. I mean, a lot of what your answers have been are similar in the sense that feedback seems to be a really big key word here. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of, you know, getting feedback in little doses rather than just, you know, in your performance reviews to kind of help you, you know, work through that. Um, and I have a feeling that the answer you're going to tell here is going to relate to feedback as well. But Alice says, I feel like I'm trying to keep up my reputation by overworking myself to please others. 
again, with that idea of, you know, the judgment from others. Mm -hmm. How does that play into the imposter syndrome and how can I stop doing this? Yeah. Well, a lot of times with imposter syndrome, we overextend and overcompensate. Um, I call it overfunctioning. We overfunction because we're fearful that we're not doing enough. So we try to do more, right? And we think that will compensate for our perceived insecurities. Um, so first and foremost, actually, I won't say feedback <laughs> um, because I think this comes down to boundaries. I think this comes down to figuring out where you actually might be overfunctioning. to a lot of times I see it on teams where uh, it's actually to the detriment of the team. So a manager or a leader might be doing a lot more work or really making them super accessible to making themselves really accessible to a lot of people to the point where it's compromising their work and just has exploded their workload. So you really have to look at managing your boundaries around your time and look at where you may be doing more than your share and where that needs to be adjusted. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's great advice right there. Um, we have another comment slash question. I'm currently job searching and had a horrible experience where my reference totally talked down about me and cost me a job after they said they'd be happy to recommend me. My imposter syndrome has now ballooned. So what's your advice for getting over that when somebody has completely shot you down? Oh, that is so, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That's definitely a really upsetting situation. So you're right to be reacting in the way you are, I think. And my best advice is to process it, you know, feel what you need to feel and let yourself have that for a period of time and then get back on your feet, you know, get back out there, understand that um, this was a really unfortunate situation to be put in, but it doesn't have to be the end of you. And it sounds like, you do have other supportive people in your corner. You were getting interviews. So all of that is a good sign that you can do this again. And it's really unfortunate to have a setback like that. But to put it in perspective that it says a lot more about that person and the fact that they told you one thing and did another than it does about your capabilities. Yeah, definitely. That is a really terrible situation. Yeah. So sorry I had to go through that. Um, somebody asked, are there any helpful books about imposter syndrome that you would recommend? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> the Secret Thoughts of Successful Women by Valerie Young is one of my favorites. Um, uh, now I'm blanking. On <laughs> I have a list. I have a list of them. I will send them to you. Uh, the Confidence Code and by Caddy K and... I'm not remembering her name. Um, the other, she is a co-writer. Uh, those are those are two of my favorites. I will send you other though, other though, because I do have a list of them. Great. Um, okay, and I think we have time for one last question. Debbie asks, do others help push your imposter syndrome, or do they bring it out more? I guess they could play into both, but how do you see them playing into both roles? Say that again? Not sure I understand. Do others help you kind of like push your imposter syndrome away or do they bring it out more? And how can they help you? You mean in general? Yes. Okay. Uh, it can go either way. I think that's the importance of having supportive, positive people around you who are going to give you uh, honest feedback, who are going to be, you know, your hype woman when you need it. Who are going to keep you in check when you're kind of going down that route of having these irrational thoughts and who say like how realistic is that you can do this you've been there before who push you to see opportunities where you may not see it because um, certainly i mean you could be stuck in a toxic workplace that is only reinforcing some of these feelings um so it, it can absolutely go either way cool um, okay, and then it looks like we've got most of the questions answered. We're going to have to jump off now. Um, just a quick thing, Melody, if you want to switch back uh, to the page with your workbook, we have a lot of people asking for that link again, just so they can see sure. it one well, actually, more time. Yeah, I'll send you a copy so that you can Perfect. send it out to everyone. 
Yeah. So yeah. we will be including all of this information in an email post uh, after this is over. We'll also have a recording so you can come back, watch any of the questions you may have missed. Uh, Melody will also include the names of the books that she recommends. I see a few of you asking for that. We'll include all of that in an email after this. Um, I just want to say thank you again to Melody. This was a really incredible conversation that we had today. We're really great to have you on. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, yeah, it was such a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. We'll catch you next time. Bye.